This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. The concept of folding space has been suggested as a means of traveling throughout our universe faster than light, but what happens when you start putting creases in the parchment of reality? Welcome to another Sci-Fi Sunday here on Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, where we let our hair down a bit on scientific realism, put our Vulcan ears on, and explore concepts in science fiction to see how likely they are, and how something similar might come about if not. So grab a drink and a snack and let's get to it. Today we'll be continuing our long-running Fashion Light FTL Travel and Communication series by looking at the concept of folding space. This is a means of travel that's been proposed in fiction quite a lot, probably most famously in Frank Herbert's Legendary Dune series, although few details are given there and not always consistently. Indeed as is often the case with FTL systems in science fiction, since they are usually a footnote to permit the story's plot, not the plot itself, details are often scarce and conflicting. The basic form of folding space is that it is instantaneous travel, something even wormholes don't really offer, being shortcuts not total bypasses, and indeed ones that might require months or even years for many models, not mere moments. This is accomplished by bringing two points together rather than speeding the trip up between them. It is the assertion that the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line, or a geodesic, but rather that it's no distance at all, that it's zero. The analogy given is that if I draw points A and B on a piece of paper, I can draw any number of lines between them, but if I fold that sheet so A and B touch, then they are at the same place. This is folding space. And again this is not how a wormhole works, even though folks will often demonstrate it this way, fold the two points over and poke a hole through with a pencil. Indeed that's exactly the analogy used by Dr. Ware in the film Event Horizon, though the film instead utilizes the concept of hyperspace, going through some other place to shorten your trip rather than no space at all. In the case of that film, the other place is literally hell, which we also see with the warp in Warhammer 40k and why fans of both often joke that Event Horizon is the unofficial prequel to 40k. So yes on the paper analogy, even boring through, but folding space isn't supposed to involve a long wormhole passage or diversion through a different type of space. I'm not sure what you're supposed to be boring through either, see our wormholes episode for more discussion of how those work, but they're parallel to folding space in that the analogy is if I have a balloon with an A and a B printed somewhere on the surface, I can squeeze that balloon at those two points until they touch. This involves destroying the whole balloon in both those regions until they stretch enough to touch, essentially now a long tunnel or wormhole, but folding space itself usually implies no distortion, it's finding a topology where those two points already touch, and we'll come back to what topology is in a moment. One of my favorite fantasy series, indeed my long running favorite, is The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan, and ironically I became aware it had a TV series version coming out at the end of the week this episode premieres on and got to see the trailer while taking a break from writing this episode. I have no idea if the TV version will be any good, fingers crossed, but the books are excellent in many respects and one of the reasons that the author, Robert Jordan, was a physicist by training and tend to keep his magic in the series very rules constrained, a habit he shares with his posthumous successor Brandon Sanderson. Thinking through the consequences and additional uses, see what we encourage folks to do when making up new science and technology in science fiction. Keeping the spoilers minimal, we find out that there's basically three similar but distinct magic systems in the setting, the polar opposite Sidar and Sidene, the female and male halves of normal magic, called the One Power in spite of the dichotomy, and the True Power as it's called, which is basically magic for the setting's devil equivalent, the Dark One. In the novels he'd often explain how an effect was happening and that each of the three systems did it so differently that they couldn't teach each other. Their form of instantaneous travel, long lost and simply called traveling, uses three different methods. We are first shown a weaker form that involves stepping to some other place, traveling there and coming back, called skimming, and this is another hyperspace example like we looked at in the Edge of the Universe episode some time back. 
But then we've got the genuine instant transport methods through what they call a gateway. We are told that one system does this by boring a hole through the pattern of reality, whereas its opposite power system does this by creating a similarity between the two places instead. The true power, or demonic version, seems to just rip the origin location out of reality then cram it into the destination spot like some parasitic graft of two chunks of space-time, forcing reality to scab over the injury. And indeed destroying reality is shown to be a major goal of the chief bad guy of that series and we see it degrade throughout the tale. Now besides it being a series that I love that's coming out in TV form soon, and wanting some other popular reference besides Dune, I mention Wheel of Time because it does call out the multiple ways Space Fournier occurs. You've got three completely different methods that would imply three entirely different sets of physical laws. First we get the we said space fording but really meant hyperspace or wormholes that we see with skimming and some other alternate reality travel in the series, then we get the various ways folks tend to analogize the concept of space fording, essentially boring a hole through space after fording it together, fording it by creating similarities in the places, and just bypassing the notion of fording by just ripping chunks out of space and stuffing them somewhere else. It's fantasy but it's also highlighting how these approaches get used in sci-fi. Sci-fi settings often allow many different methods of FTL travel, Star Trek did this a lot and we see it a lot in many tech trees of 4X Space Empire games, but each hypothetical FTL method we have is based around assuming the laws of physics work in a specific way, and if they don't, it doesn't work. And if they do, it does, but those other FTL methods do not. It's not a smorgasbord of options. It is a collection of possibilities, one of which would be true, not all, and honestly I doubt any of them all. Now I think we need to take a moment to discuss topology. Topology is a math term that sounds very impressive but in many ways it's just the study of the tops of things, or how the properties of surface areas and other geometric objects are preserved even when you warp or deform them. As a quick example, if we ignore three dimensions and only think about the surface of a piece of paper, or a balloon, then twisting or smushing these doesn't mean the folks moving around their surfaces have a different map to travel, same as if you took a paper map of Earth and folded up like an origami bird. The various roads on that map between cities still run there. It doesn't matter how warped it is, the town next to mine, when it's flat, are still next to mine when they are twisted, but it might be that if I could leave the 2D sheet of paper, like by traveling through some higher third dimension, I could reach another continent where it was folded near me but not touching, and if it was touching then BAM, the closest distance between two points, is zero. How I switch between them, these two points on a surface for it to touch each other, is rather tricky. I can poke a hole through, or I can meld the two together. Now in topology you don't get to open holes, close holes, tail the surface, glue it together, or make it pass through itself, so generally any discussion of folding space is already outside of the basic topological laws. This is not limited to two-dimensional surfaces either, those are just the easy examples. And it's another place where we get the notion of looking at reality as a three-dimensional surface of a four-dimensional object from. This is also where we get the concept of manifolds from, in the context of weird space-time thingies in sci-fi. Both the line and the circle are example of topological manifolds, usually deemed the easiest and second easiest examples incidentally. Parabolas and hyperbolas are too, and a square is not a basic manifold because it has corners, and to oversimplify a bit, sharp corners are mathematically tricky, akin to singularities in general. Now a singularity in math is any point where a mathematical object is not defined, and thus tends to represent paradoxical behavior compared to the normal on that object often the universe at large. Take a string, ignoring its thickness, and you have a line or a one-dimensional manifold. Drop it on the floor so it crawls into a heap, and now you've got a bunch of singularities wherever one segment of the rope intersects another, and as you might guess, this connection is poorly defined in one dimension, but it's just fine in two or three, where you can imagine some insect walking along the rope. Now that it's curled up, being able to jump over a lot of rope by just going between two places where it intersects. This is why higher dimensions are so vital to many cosmological models, adding them helps get around apparent singularities or paradoxes in three dimensions. But when we try to bring this into the actual Universe, it gets a bit tricky. You get those paradoxes. 
We folded bits of paper together and that works fine in 3D space, but it doesn't in 2D space and folding the universe doesn't work well in 3D. What's the spot look like? Is it a big rip in reality? Is it a similarity and if so, do we have to make two places identical to move them together like that? Imagine for the moment the sheet of paper only this time instead of an A or B I put two colored dots, red and blue. If I dab them on and touch them together, are they going to naturally merge to be purple together? Is blue ink going to run on the white paper around it? Do I need to have folks at both sides adding more red or blue ink to each spot until they match in color? Do I need to make the red and blue dot exactly the same shade of purple, and if I did, would that form my gateway? And these are basically the logical loopholes going into space folding. But there's another two, it takes energy to fold a sheet of paper, real, actual energy, and if you do it with something like a sheet of metal, you will feel the metal warm up as you fold it, until it breaks from too much of it, and both that energy usage and possible breakage come up in discussion of space folding too. How much energy does it take to fold the entire universe? Presumably a lot. I mean we can bend space and time, very literally, and it takes a lot of energy. We also know there's a lot of energy in any given chunk of space time too. Under the upper limits of the cosmological constant, there's a nanojoule of energy in a cubic meter of free space as vacuum energy. That should seem fine, since cramming two cubic kilometers of empty space together to move a ship from one to another would require only one joule of energy from each to be merged, assuming it was a true vacuum. I'm not sure we could ignore the mass energy of all the dust and gas in that vacuum, or even of that ship, and some multi-megaton spaceship is carrying hundreds of trillions of trillions of joules of energy, not one or two. But that's at the upper limit in the cosmological constant, and this is where we need to discuss vacuum energy, because a joule per cubic kilometer is the vacuum energy of space under the cosmological constant, or even less than that. However there's a mismatch with what's predicted from quantum field theory, originally we thought it might be 120 orders of magnitude higher. A trillion 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 times higher. Though newer modeling suggests the degree of mismatch is only 60 orders of magnitude, a mere trillion, 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 trillion times higher, which for perspective, if true, would mean the quantum energies in the vacuum contained all the mass energy of our entire sun squeezed into a spot about the size of a football stadium, which is much better than all of it squeezed into something the size of an atom that the previous mismatch had, but still seems absurdly dense and indeed still would be dense enough that such a sphere would instantly turn into a black hole. Of course it isn't just this single spot, it is everywhere. So no collapse to a singularity I suppose. But this prediction under quantum field theory, either the 120 or 60 magnitude version, is the reason why vacuum energy is considered so potentially awesome in sci-fi. The idea of folding two such spots on top of each other, and possibly causing one of those two sets of quantum energy to spring out, is not considered out of the question and would be quite the doomsday weapon. Possibly universally too, this is akin to the notion of false vacuum collapse which is considered one theoretical model for the universe being destroyed. Indeed in brain cosmology, a cousin of string theory, our universe is on a brain short for membrane, a three-dimensional object in a higher dimensional space known as the bulk. And gravity is weaker than the other forces because it can leak into the bulk, and in this topology-rich theory, brains, with different universes on them, can touch and intersect and even collide, think Big Bang, and that would specifically be the ekpyrotic model, though there's some others too. Needless to say, brain cosmology does permit the notion of warping a brain, or folding space, and if you want to delve into the math of how, this comes down to manifolds again, especially Calabi-Ya manifolds. I'm noted for my dislike for string theory which I suspect tends to make me bad at explaining it and probably understanding it too, so I'll attach a lecture from David Morrison on the matter. Nutshell form though, since we tend to assume this whole setup is the reason or origin for how gravity and dark energy behave, and since those both involve stretching or compacting space-time, we deduce it may be possible to artificially forward space this way. The concern of course is that the point of connection or boring through, whichever, might be rather explosive. I will also note that this permits travel to other manifolds and brains, i.e. universes, and time travel too. 
It also potentially makes for an unbelievable power source, and again that's the basis for vacuum or zero point energy, different but parallel concepts. Now the notion space-time hoards a single lone jewel per cubic kilometer is much less interesting, barely enough to lift a cup of coffee, the true fuel that runs this show, but it would still make for a lot of energy if we had to bend it and doing so required using parallel amounts of energy. As an example, a light year is around 10 trillion kilometers long, and a cubic light year, 10 trillion cubed, or 10 to the 39th cubic kilometers, or 10 to the 39th joules of space-time energy. This is the mass energy of our entire moon, and the sun's total energy output for 100,000 years. It's 10 million times the energy needed to rip Earth apart. And that's just one cubic light year, our galaxy will contain trillions of times that, and the observable universe will be about 10 to 32 cubic light years, for something on order of 10 to 71 joules of energy, non-coincidentally that's pretty parallel to the mass energy of the entire universe. Uh, keep in mind this is the cosmological constant values for vacuum energy, the quantum field theory ones, even the conservative 60 orders of magnitude higher version, do not require interstellar volumes to get universal levels of energy. This is part of why we can discuss setting off micro big bangs and bottled universes. It's hard to say how much energy it takes to forward space in this universe, so two distant points of it touch, but considering we have to move an entire sheet of paper to afford it, moving an entire universe to afford it seems plausible too. But not necessarily, nor does it necessarily need to be powered internally, any more than I need energy from a sheet of paper to bend it. Indeed when folding the paper or squeezing the partially deflated ball, the energy is entirely external and is being resisted internally. We push, it shoves back. A sharp flat fold might be easier, in the same way it takes a lot of energy to cut a board with a saw, but one slicing through one only a molecule thick, rather than a few millimeters, might take way less energy. Well the smallest distance in the Universe, we believe, is a Planck length, and that's so tiny it is to an atom what an atom is to the planet, coming in at about 10 to the negative 35 meters. Such being the case, a square slice of space a light year wide on each side and one Planck length thick only contains about a thousandth of a cubic meter or one trillionth of a joule of space-time energy, so if you imagine a sheet the size of the whole observable universe wide, or a circle 46.5 billion light years in radius, but just one Planck length thick, we'd only have about 7 billion trillion square light years or 7 billion billion cubic meters, or 7 billion joules of space-time energy. And mind you, that is the upper limit under the cosmological constant modeling. It could be smaller. Now that's not a tiny amount of energy, but it's like 50 gallons of gas. So even if you had to supply that every second, requiring a very large modern nuclear reactor or hydroelectric dam, it is doable, especially in sci-fi terms. Now this is utter wild speculation. We're not really doing science here, we're throwing concepts at the wall and plugging related numbers into them. Great for writing a realistic feeling sci-fi, but not science, and hence why it's a sci-fi Sunday episode. And even if we could do that Planck length wide sheet, it might be that Sassania took that much energy per Planck time, which is even smaller to a second than a Planck length is to a meter, in which case you might need to burn through whole stars to fold the universe for a single heartbeat. Does this violate known science? Well, unlike a lot of our FTL systems, no it does not, it merely posits our universe exists in something higher dimensional, which we have no real evidence for or against, and that it has topology that can be manipulated, with the usual assumption being through gravitons or whatever dark energy is. Indeed I once heard someone describe dark energy as the thing leaking out from the crack in the space-time manifold as it bent and expanded, though I suspect that analogy is more amusing than accurate. So is folding space possible? Well if those assumptions are true, that the Universe does exist inside something higher dimensional, it can be bent around, then yes. Though some would argue that higher dimensionality is not necessarily required. How you do it, no clue. But possibly through application of something like a gravity laser or non-omnidirectional gravity beam, or maybe a curl ring. Not by shooting beams of light out your mouth like do navigators seem to do in the 1984 David Lynch film but as I recall that's symbolically representing them picking possible paths or folds that would move the ship safely. Which to close out brings us back to the issue of what we mean by folding space because in that series or others with the instant jump we were often told of concerns like accidentally passing through a star. 
This is exceedingly unlikely normally since space is so empty and few straight lines pass through a single star even over a whole galaxy, but the usual notion is that gravity is warping space so things taking advantage of that tend to get yanked more towards such big objects. Which is fine for a story, but you're not folding space between two points if you can run into other things on that manifold or sheet, again the Universe, while traveling from point A to point B, because you're not traveling through the Universe. Or through some other Universe. Alright, let's wrap this into a closed time-like loop to the beginning to finish for the day. If you can warp space, and we can, you can shorten the distance between two points, This is not folding space, it's compacting the sheet, opposite of stretching it, not folding two bits together. This is how warp drive works. But folding space is bending and probably requires tearing or poking, and that would seem to inherently imply higher dimensions as it's not allowed under topology without those getting around it. Which to close on, raises the point that if you can make any two points in our Universe touch by folding them through some higher reality also presumably means you can find other Universes to explore or settle. So folding space seems like a potentially good way to colonize our Universe, but it is probably more valuable ultimately, if you can do it, for letting you forward space to other Universes. Just keep in mind, in many models of brains in higher dimensions, folding bits of them together tends to have explosive effects the kind that makes supernovae look like firecrackers, the kind of very big bangs that start universes, and perhaps in them too. I was talking a bit today about the general misconceptions folks often get with terms like singularity and space-time warping, and I want to give a shout out to the Cosmic Front series over on CuriosityStream for the great depth they give to black holes and other space topics compared to the norm. That's something I try to aim for here on the show too, which is why even our bonus fun episodes, like today's Sci-Fi Sunday episode, often tend to get into longer details, though I do try to keep them shorter, and as I was prepping this episode for release it occurred to me I had not discussed how space folding technology would impact colonizing space. So we will go ahead and do an extended segment for today's episode over on Nebula, looking at colonizing space with space folding tech. A lot of our episodes on Nebula are longer and uncut, but we make up for it by cutting out ads and sponsor reads. If you didn't know, Nebula is our streaming service full of awesome content from STEM creators like Real Engineering, Mustard, Answers with Joe, MKBHD, Renee Ritchie, and a bunch of others. It's designed to give creators more freedom than other platforms, and all of our episodes of this show appear early and ad-free on Nebula. And we have some extended editions too, like today's, as well as some Nebula exclusives, like our Coexistence with Alien series. Now you can subscribe to Nebula all by itself, but we've also partnered up with CuriosityStream, the home of thousands of great educational videos, to offer Nebula for free as a bonus if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in our episode description. That lets you see content like the Cosmic Front series, just some of the amazing content on CuriosityStream, and all the great content over on Nebula for myself and many others, and you can get all of that for less than $15 by using the link in the episode's description. Incidentally, this month's episode was obviously partially inspired by the new Dune film and Wheel of Time series coming out, and that was also the case for last month's Sci-Fi Sunday episode on sentient plants and world consciousnesses, in regard to Isaac Asimov's Foundation series getting adapted to TV, as in the later novels we get introduced to a planetary consciousness, and we gave a lot of examples and skipped many others. Two I felt especially bad for forgetting about were Stanislaw Lem's Sentient Oceans from his classic Solaris, and David Brin's superconducting perovskite mantle from his novel Earth, and both were previous books of the month on this show. Now I also mentioned today that hyperspace in Asimov's Foundation series sometimes is described as a space folding method, and with that new Foundation show having folks asking my opinion on the series, for folks opting to read the novels now, there was a second Foundation trilogy released after Asimov's death by his friends and fellow sci-fi authors, David Brin, Gregory Benford, and Greg Bayer, and that trilogy indoor and series indoor, Foundation's Triumph by Brin, is my personal favorite in the entire series not including Asimov's original trilogy and prelude. Alright, so with those sci-fi recommendations we will wrap up another Sci-Fi Sunday, and we will be back next month for a look at staking and jumping claims in space colonization. We have plenty of regular Thursday episodes before then though, 
and this Thursday we return to our Alien Civilization series to contemplate aliens with tempos and aggressive tendencies in belligerent aliens, and in two weeks we'll talk about another colonization strategy for space, saving Earth, before closing out the month with our live stream Q&A. Now if you want to make sure you get notified when those episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed the episode don't forget to hit the like button and share it with others. If you'd like to help support future episodes you can donate to us on Patreon, or our website IsaacArthur.net, and Patreon and our website are linked in the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.